good afternoon everybody or wherever you are good morning from if you are in america or good evening if you are from asia sylvia please introduce our speakers hello thank you thank you for the the, the word so um hello everyone welcome to our webinar it is our pleasure to have you with us this afternoon or this morning as he said before uh, let me quickly guide you uh, through the webinar how it will work it will last about one hour we will have two speeches mm -hmm. and you see our speakers here with us uh, in the panels and each presentation will last about 20 minutes and then we will have a dedicated time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar we will also have a short debate anytime you can ask questions in the box on your right the question box or you can also use the chat please make us your questions and we will read them in the dedicated times you can also be in touch with us via email if there is no time to answer all the questions or you something raises your mind later you can contact us via email as well and we will also send the video and the presentations of the speakers if you wish to see it a second time as well now it is my pleasure to introduce the speakers to, to you we have with us francesco mastrapasqua institutional affairs manager for EPTA refrigeration and we have with us Kevin Norris, a technical training specialist for Frascold. We also have, of course, our director, Marco Buoni, the president of AREA, who will be the moderator of this event. And of course, now it is my pleasure to leave him the word. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Silvia. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, Kevin. Nice to see you. you here today. Thank you to all our participants. Uh, I will give a small introduction just to let uh, all the participants to arrive to our uh, webinar. Uh, as said, I am um, the president of AREA. I will uh, uh, just take a few moments uh, of presentation and I will speak just uh, uh, very quickly about uh, what uh, is our sector at the moment and uh, what is uh, uh, the situation in uh, eco uh, in the environment friendly rack systems and uh, also we'll tell you about uh, what we're going to uh, hear about eco design eco labeling just a few uh, few words before our speakers um as um, uh, centro studi galileo and uh, as uh, atf the, European, the italian association of refrigeration we do training, conferences, certification, and we, do, we have done in around 140 countries, and uh, in particular in Italy, and uh, around uh, 10,000 technicians have been certified uh, with us. Also, we help many countries like Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, Tunisia, and uh, many more countries to start the certification scheme on alternative refrigerant and on synthetic refrigerant which is very important. In this picture, you can see some training in Gambia, Argentina, in Balkanic countries, etc. Also, we use for our training the project Real Alternatives, which is a project about training on alternative refrigerants, which means uh, doing training on alternative refrigerants means that we uh, have theoretical and practical training where you can get at the end a certification like you can see in the picture here, which uh, can be something you show when you are handling a system with alternative refrigerant. We would like to be uh, certificate to be mandatory, especially in Europe, that we are going to see a um, phase down, we are seeing a phase down on uh, synthetic refrigerants. So we are going to see an uptake in new natural and synthetic low GOP refrigerant. So we want to see a certification. I will tell you later also how we are doing to make this happen. Um, also, we organize conferences. And in this conference, uh, in particular, the one uh, that we are going to, um, to organize in Milan on the 10 or 11 of June, we um, are going to discuss about many important topics like the latest technology of refrigeration and air conditioning. For example, we're going to talk about the revision of the gas regulation. We're going to talk about eco-design, eco, eco something we are, do, we are talking today, but also refrigerants, new compressors, new vehicle chain, vaccines, for example, which is very uh, popular and very actual 
actual uh, topic. So how to uh, transport uh, uh, the vaccines. Um, last uh, conference was uh, live, but this time, of course, due to what we are, uh, what is, is in the period, this period, the pandemic, we organize, we're going to organize it uh, mix hybrid. You can be online if you want by this kind of systems with webinars, or you can be present on site in University of Milan in um, the 10 or 11 of June. So it's your up to you if you want to be online or on site. I hope, to be honest, to see you all on site and uh, I, uh, not to shake your hands, but just to say you hello. Just a few information about an important topic for me uh, and for all of us, I believe, because it's changed a lot our sector, in particular in Europe, the gas regulation. Now, you probably know, we are going to a process about the changing, the amendment, uh, the revision of the gas regulation. We started last June when the British Clima uh, nominated a consultant of research in particular, and uh, we had uh, in July, September, a roadmap, uh, an impact assessment uh, roadmap, uh, and we gave the comments uh, now is, there is a public consultation, interviews, Area already had an interview with uh, the consultant, and uh, we have um, a, probably, most probably, a consultation forum with all the stakeholders, end of April. End of April, we will probably see uh, the evaluation and impact assessment of the European Commission to give us what is the view for the new revision of the gas regulation. We are looking forward for that to the end of April to see what uh, will be. But of course, we already want something to be in this uh, uh, new revision. And we heard that something is going to happen. And we have to tell you something about what can be the new gas regulation the review. In June, the assessment will be concluded. And probably end of 2021, end of this year, we will have a proposal for the revision. And 2022-2023, probably will have it in place. We have it, the new gas regulation in place. Of course, we are going to talk more and more about alternative refrigerants, about uh, energy efficiency, about even lower GOP refrigerants and systems. But in particular, area has um, important uh, uh, comments. And most of this, uh, I think, will be inside the revision. In particular, mandatory certification for personnel and company using alternative refrigerant. This is our, one of our milestones, and I think will happen. We don't know how, because we are just giving some proposals how to do it. Real alternatives is on the plate, is on the table, because real alternatives is working as a, a, a alternative refrigerant training and certification schemes, already applying in 17 countries in Europe already uh, around 1,000 technicians certified. In particular, in Spain, is already mandatory, uh, this kind of uh, certification. And also in Estonia, is starting. Also, we think that will be included uh, mobile refrigeration and conditioning. For example, to extend truck and trailers of any size, crane, ships, bus, will probably be included. We will tackle illegal trade. We'll tackle illegal trade because it's important to tackle illegal trade of refrigerants. Now we have um, a lot of uh, refrigerants, in particular, maybe in Spain, in Italy, in Greece, which come from illegal sources. You don't know what is in it for safety, but also for the good implementation of phase down. We want to achieve the phase down as it was planned. So we need to, to work on the illegal trade. And we are doing a lot. We're working with customs, we're working with uh, uh, contractors to buy only legal refrigerant. Also, we would like to enlarge the scope of the regulation to include alternative refrigerants and to have provisions also including alternative refrigerants. Leak checking, also for alternative refrigerants, periodic inspection, purchase of natural refrigerant only by certified com companies. And also, we would like to include the energy efficiency first principle, not only GLP, but also TWI. Total equivalent warming impact, which means uh, we want to check that we change refrigerant, but we have a good system on energy efficiency side. 
uh, European Commission received 75 feedbacks uh, from all stakeholders. And many of those comments were about these topics. So I think a uh, few of those are already uh, in a good place to be to happen. I would like to tell you a few things before I start uh, properly the training. We have uh, at the moment 120 participants. So welcome everybody, 120 participants in our uh, webinar. I would like to tell you that uh, all our webinars uh, are available. You can see all the webinars that we had in the past one year. We had around 15 webinars. We have a lot of webinars because it was very successful, the webinars we have done uh, in the past year. But also, it's five years that we, uh, we are organizing webinars like this one. Um, and also, I would like to invite you to follow our future webinars, our CSG webinar series. Also, we have a magazine, which is an international magazine published with United Nations Environment Program and with International Institute of Refrigeration. We are partner of them and also they are partner of our conference. And uh, this last magazine was presented in the Portugal Montreal Conference. The last on-site Portugal Montreal Conference was in uh, Rome, here in Italy. So we had the, the pleasure to have all here in Italy for uh, at the FAO, the FAO. Uh, in Rome, and we presented this important issue where many speakers spoken about uh, alternative refrigerant, transition, new phase down, Kigali amendment. Because uh, you all know that not Europe is only doing a phase down, but globally we are going to have a phase down. But today we are talking to uh, even greater subject, uh, and I thank our partners, all the partners that join us, that are part of our team. In particular today, I welcome Francesco Pasqua and Kevin Norris that are going to talk about this important topic of eco design, eco labeling, environment friendly drug systems. And in particular now, I pass the word to Francesco of EPTA. Francesco is uh, um, the institutional affairs manager of EPTA and is going to talk about something important like the efficiency of systems and how to label this efficiency. So Francesco, nice to see you again here with us. Thank you, Marco. My Thanks pleasure. everybody. Thanks I'm everybody. The presenter mode, wait a second. I have a check, you should have received it. Yes. We see your presentation yes. perfectly. Thank you, Francesco. Very good, very good. Hello everybody. Uh, my presentation uh, goes on uh, eco design and energy labeling European regulations. These regulations uh, are referred to refrigerating appliances with the direct sales function and regulate uh, the uh, sale of new products, both from uh, energy consumption and environmental impact point of view. These two regulations are commonly referred to as twin regulations because they address uh, at the same time, they address, sorry, there's a problem with my screen, I suppose. Do you see my screen? Yes, we see it very well. Okay, very good. So these two regulations are commonly referred to as twin regulations because they address the same goal and start the application period on the same date, which is March 1st, 2021, which is actually next week. The products impacted are supermarket refrigerating cabinets, freezers and refrigerators, self-contained plug-in cabinets, beverage coolers, small ice cream freezers, gelato scooping cabinets, and refrigerated vending machines. The energy labeling and eco-design regulations Establish the general rule principles for refrigerating appliances with the direct sales function. Eco design states minimum mandatory efficiency requirements for the products that will circulate in the European market and their ecological performance. The energy labeling scheme, on the other side, will highlight the product's energy efficiency and annual energy consumption with, within the energy label. The technical documentation and the product information. The Energy Efficiency Index, EEI, 
which is the ratio between the annual energy consumption of a product and the standard annual energy consumption, which is the market average, decides if a product can be sold in the EU market or not and its positioning. So it's particularly important. In fact, all refrigerating appliances with direct access function must have a EEI below 100 on March 1st and below 80 just two years later in September 2023, except for ice cream freezers that will have to be below 80 and then below 50 in September 2023. These limits apply on products that are placed on the European market for the first time by the manufacturer or the importer in the EU market after March 1st this year. Products that do not comply with these limits will be banned from the European market. Products already in the warehouses of dealers, like for example, that have been placed in the market by original manufacturer at March 1st can of course be sold also afterwards. As you can see here, the energy efficiency index is also used to decide the energy rating of products. The end user can finally compare products that apparently look identical, but have very different energy and functional performances. Manufacturers, on the other hand, have a tool to prove that their products perform better than their competitors. And globally, there is an increase in the average efficiency of the products sold in the European market. Let me uh, give you some considerations about the initial scenario as far as energy classes are concerned. In the initial, initial scenario, the A class will be empty due to the extremely high efficiency limits intentionally set by the European Commission to make the A class empty. Over time, the A-class will be populated with new and better products. In B-class, we will find the very best ice cream freezers. Like other product categories where the energy leveling scheme is in place since many years, like household refrigeration, for example, or electronics, those who will buy a commercial display cabinet class C in 2021 should be aware that they are buying the best in its class. In future, innovation will introduce new A and B products available for purchase, thus pulling the market up. It is very important to understand very well this concept in order to transmit to our clients the real value of the products that they will buy. So ultimately, what happens from next week? If you are a manufacturer or an authorized dealer, representative or an importer in the European market, you need to make sure the energy level is clearly displayed at any point of sale, like showrooms and trade fairs, and that the energy efficiency rating appears on all promotional materials, online sale platforms, commercial offers, and any other marketing document, and of course, must be shipped with the product. What information do we find in the energy level? As you can see, primarily, there's a clear, direct, crisp information about the energy rating of the product, the class. There is a, the annual energy efficiency consumption in kilowatt hours per annum, then there is uh, information about the displaying or the capacity of the product and the temperature class, especially in the refrigerating uh, cabinets and freezers for supermarket, you will have the total display area on the left and the product temperature range, so the warmest and the coldest product uh, in, the, in the cabinet, clearly displayed in the energy level. Actually, looking at the, the entire uh, range of uh, commercial refrigeration equipment, there's not only display cabinets, there's also beverage coolers and ice cream freezers, which have very, very similar energy levels. 
On you, you can see beverage coolers and ice cream freezers have similar energy levels, having the only difference having on the lower part of the level, the internal volume of the product, the warmest product temperature within the cabinet, and the maximum ambient temperature you can use the appliance on the lower part of the level. The levels are practically identical. Will all the refrigerating appliances bear the energy level? The answer is nearly yes. There are some exclusions in the regulation and in the European recommendation, but they are very, very small exclusions, like uh, saladettes, like refrigerating appliances for the sale of live food stuff like uh, living fish, shellfish, and so on, horizontal serve overs with integrated uh, uh, reserve compartment at the back, corner cabinets, vending machines for frozen food, serve over fish counters with flaky ice, but that's, that's really few cabinets. All the others will be level, will have the energy level on. Another key tool of the new eco design and energy labeling regulations is certainly April. As of March 1st, next week, then, suppliers, manufacturers, importers, or authorized dealers in Europe need to register their products in April before placing them on the European market. April is the European product registry for energy labeling. It's a global European database. Customers, as well as market surveillance authorities and EU Commission, will find all the products circulating in the EU market, a global aggregated view, registered in April without any exception. It's very important. Information in April remains visible until eight years after the product will be phased out from the market. And with April, the clients will have much more information than ever to compare and wisely decide which are the most efficient products for their source. At this point, the key takeaways are that eco-design, energy labeling and April help the client to compare products, to make informed decisions and give an aggregate view of the products available in the market. And as a result, the market will be more and more driven to privilege the best products in class, and little by little, they will abandon the worst products. And the overall result will be a global energy saving in Europe, which will bring Europe much closer to the main goals of the European Green Deal. But it's not finished. The new regulations introduce a very important concept, the circular economy. The circular economy model is another essential milestone in the frame of the European Green Deal to reduce the industry carbon's emission. It is the opposite of the traditional linear economy model based for many years on the take use dispose. All products and materials are highly valued. They must be used many times in the productive cycle, reusing them, repairing, reconditioning, recycling, and then at the end of their lifetime, uh, dismantled and uh, recuperated all materials. The point here is to extend the product's life. So this results in specific requirements regarding the availability and the maximum delivery time for spare parts, on information on repair, maintenance and specific dismantling instructions to recover and recycle the materials to prevent disposal. Spare parts, for instance, need to be widely available for at least eight years after the product has been phased out from the market. Repair and maintenance information, instructions, schemes must be made available for professional repairs. Specific dismantling instructions must be available to recover and recycle all materials. These are no longer good practices, but specific requirements of the eco-design law and obligations for the manufacturers. Let me mention at this point in time, a very important document that's been published in January in Europe by Eurovent Association. This document 
provides a sound interpretation of the regulations of eco-design and energy labeling and presents the industry view on how is the best, what is the best approach and the best, uh, uh, let's say, interpretation, practical interpretation to guide the application of the, uh, the eco-design and energy labeling regulations to guarantee the best results and the best effectiveness in the market. Very important document. I invite everybody to download this document in the Eurovent website. Finally, the store of the future will be climate neutral, using only natural refrigerants that do not harm the environment and do not alter the planet climate, such as the EPTA new transcritical CO2 systems, full transcritical efficiency FTE system, and the ETE system, extreme temperature efficiency. They guarantee reliability, highest performances, and super saving mode in any climate and any part of the world. It's using the minimum amount of energy that will be created using renewable energy in any part of the world, with any temperature climate, in any store around the world. Simple, global, reliable, and available. Thank you very much. Very good, uh, Francesco. Your information was pivotal. I think um, for the uh, European Green Deal, this is central. This is central, this information. And also for the recovery plan, I think the recovery plan, they all think about energy and the environment. So. I think your information are people done. We have questions, Sylvia? Yeah, sure. We do have questions, of course, because the presentation was very interesting. So let me start with uh, Stefano first. It's the one that came first. So the question goes, maintenance pairs must be available for how many years for registration on April? Uh, Sorry if I understood uh, two sub questions uh, around this. So registration in April is uh, required before selling products in the European market, and the information is maintained, is kept for 15 years after the last product of a specific range is, is sold. So after 15 years after the product phase out from the market. And concerning the obligation of spare parts, they must be available and they have to be delivered within 15 days uh, of the order, of the, of the sales order, and they must be available for a minimum time of eight years after the product has been phased out from the market. Okay. We have oh. 140 participants at the moment. And remember to put your questions in the question box. We have another question, right, Sibian? Yes, yeah, sure. So the question goes from Peter. He's asking a manufacturer who sells outside Europe must build their product following eco-design or can use different components? Well, eco-design, of course, relates to all products which are placed in the market within Europe, of course. Plus, uh, it must be very carefully considered the implications of the eco-design, uh, let's say, restrictions and obligations also concerning the CE uh, declaration of products. Because the, in the CE declaration of products, normally we include uh, the compliance to the eco-design regulation, which in the end uh, ultimately makes uh, the effect of eco-design not only applicable in Europe, but also with all countries that require the CE declaration for import. It's a, it's a really a very important impact of these regulations, indirect, that may affect directly or any way also exporting products to other countries outside Europe, which anyway require the CE declaration. Important aspect to keep in consideration. Thank you. Are we still on time? May I ask one more question? Sure. Okay, then. I go with the one from Anna Marie because it sounds very interesting. She's asking the old labels A++ will still be available or will they be excluded suddenly from the market? The, this year there is uh, for most products uh, and for the products that will appear, uh, that will um, 
have the bear the energy level for the first time this year there is a rescaling of the classes the a plus uh, double plus and triple plus disappear and we return to the original a to g scale and uh, this is uh, of course uh, for all products that are new for energy level and also the products that have uh, the rescaling of classes this year like household uh, appliances or, uh, or some electronics uh, the so-called winter package that is uh, rescaled this year in class, they also return to A to G. I think also Bassam, man, it's a good, ah. very good question from Bassam. Yeah, okay, if I may, I read it. How is the information entered in April verified to be the true performance of the equipment? The equipment is required to be tested in the laboratories and of course the data are auto declared by the manufacturer which of course is certifying the performance of the product exposes the performances so that this become a public declaration and a public certification of performance that will be subject to market surveillance authority and, verifi and verifications afterwards so the increase there is a general increase in the of course in the cons consistency of the information and that must be 100 percent reliable thank, thank you very you. much it was very comprehensive a lot of questions we still have two questions but i think we have to do it uh, after in the debate because uh, it's very interesting and are more com are more in general question from uh, marino and from lorenzo but uh, we will answer that at the end of, we have a debate at the end. So, um, thank you, Francesco. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you. See you in a bit. Okay. So, now I give the floor to Kevin Norris from uh, Frascold. Thank you, Kevin, for being with us. Now you should uh, appear for you. Uh, does it appear for you? Let's try again. Now, yes, we see your screen. Do you hear me now? Yes, we hear you very well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, do you do you see my screen? Yes, we see it very well. Okay. okay. Perfect. Thank you. Kevin, so about... Uh, you're going to talk about the commitment to reduce carbon footprint on HVACR system. Thank you very much, for, uh, Kevin, from Frasco. The floor is yours. Thank you. So good morning or good evening to everybody. Thank you to participate to this webinar. I just want to thank also the organization of Centro Studi Galileo for this opportunity. I am Kevin Norris, Selection Software and Technical Training Specialist of Frasco. Sorry, today, uh, after a brief introduction about Frascold, I will present an overview of carbon footprint in HVAC and refrigeration sector. We will see limitations set by the actual F-gas, then we'll face the peculiarity of uh, the main uh, uh, solution uh, with low GWP represented by natural refrigerant CO2 and hydrocarbons and uh, synthetic refrigerant like HFO and HFO blends. And uh, we will finish with conclusion. Uh, let, me let me start with uh, two words uh, about Frascold. Frascold is a leading Italian company that has been operating for more than 80 years in the world of refrigeration and air conditioning. It is a manufacturer of compressor with a production capacity of 70,000 units per year, and it is present in more than 86 countries. Some of the applications in which Frasco supply product uh, are commercial refrigeration, process cooling, industrial refrigeration, and of course, comfort of indoor ambient. So, Carbon footprint in HVAC and refrigeration sector is caused by two many sources, direct emissions and indirect emissions. With direct emissions uh, are, are considered the, air, the early refrigerant losses of the system 
that unfortunately are not negligible. And this is why it is necessary to reduce the losses itself and the average global warming potential of used refrigerants. On the other hand, it's necessary to take uh, uh, in account the indirect emissions that are mainly related to electrical consumption of the system. Improving efficiency uh, can uh, reduce this source of uh, emissions. To reduce uh, both sources, uh, it is necessary to have the competencies for the whole life cycle of the system, from the design to the, man to the maintenance. There are a lot now of interest in uh, government institutions at national and international level to set up agreement and standards to reduce all sources of emissions. Uh, the main are represented by Kigali Amendment to Montreal Protocol, FGAS for Europe, and standards related to efficiency like eco design and eco labeling that we are talking before with uh, EPTA. Uh, from national level, also, there are some countries that are setting up tax schemes uh, on HFCs and uh, some uh, incentives and subsidies uh, to promote uh, GWP, uh, low GWP refrigerants. One possible uh, ratio uh, to evaluate uh, both impact could be the TWI, the total equivalent warming impact. This ratio is a combination of direct impact evaluation and indirect impact evaluation during the complete life of the system. The direct impact is calculated basically considering the liquid ratio, the operative life of the system, and the end GWP of the used refrigerant. Indirect impact is calculated considering annual energy consumption, operative life, and a ratio that takes in account the uh, specific emission of the, co of the electrical consumption. Regarding uh, direct emission, uh, FGAS set up uh, a phase down of uh, HFC consumption in the framework of Kigali Amendment of Montreal Protocol. The dotted violet line is the FGAS schedule. It is possible to see how the FGAS is more restrictive than Kigali general indications. Europe, uh, for the moment, as the target to reduce by 79% the consumption of HFC comparing to the baseline calculated in the average uh, consumption during the period uh, 20, uh, 2009 and 2012. The European Commission, like uh, as said uh, by Marco Buoni before, are now working on a revision of FGAS to meet more ambitious target of sustainability. One other disposition of uh, FGAS is the phase out of some refrigerant using as merit parameter the global warming potential. For each uh, specific application, there is different limit in terms of GWP and the date in which these limitation take place. In this table, it is possible to see uh, that from January 2020, new installations are prohibited with refrigerant with GWP above 2,500. But let's focus on the near future scenario, starting from 2022. For commercial freeze, fridge and freezer, new installations are allowed uh, with GWP under 150. The same for centralized refrigeration system with power above 40 kilowatt used in commercial refrigeration. For centralized refrigeration system with capacity below 40 kilowatt, the limit of 2,500 remains the same till 2030. The upper stage of a cascade system is limited under 1,500. In the present, present scenario, we have to consider also the existing plant for which uh, is extended the prohibition uh, for system with more than 
140 CO2 equivalent tons to recharge with virgin refrigerant with GWP above 2,500. But F-gas admit also some exceptions in which limits in terms of maxim maximum GWP are not applied. One of those are systems uh, enslaved to utility with operative uh, temperature lower than minus 50 Celsius and some military application. So taking account F-gas limitation and efficiency consideration, which is the best refrigerant for the future? There is not a unique answer because there is not a perfect refrigerant that suits all the application. One refrigerant that uh, are now placing uh, itself as a reference in the commercial refrigeration market is CO2, with an impressive growth in recent years. Uh, we observe a rising interest not only in commercial refrigeration, but also in other sectors. Advantages of CO2 are well known, starting from its uh, high availability on the market. CO2 is a natural fluid and the waste product from various types of industries. So its production, it is not related to a, a one single sector. This is a good point that makes uh, CO2 cheaper and with a price less influenced by fluctuation. It is considered a long-term refrigerant uh, in the actual uh, regulation framework due its very low GWP. CO2 has uh, good performances uh, in integrated system that can be enslaved to various utility together, leading to an integrated efficiency. CO2 has uh, also very good thermodynamic property uh, like it transferred and volumetric refrigerating capacity. Otherwise, uh, the introduction of CO2 brings some uh, challenges, uh, the higher operating and standstill pressure compared to the use of HFCs, complex cycle for obtaining high efficiency, and the necessity to have more qualified technicians. And clearly, the use of components specific for CO2 application. Facing uh, CO2 applications leads uh, to dedicated and specific design, also in compressors manufacturing. Uh, automotive derived uh, solution have been introduced, like advanced sealing on pistons uh, to reduce at minimum the oil carryover and to guarantee the optimal and constant lubrication of the compressors. Fluid dynamics has been improved, especially in the suction and dis discharge port on valve plate. Its exchange between low and high side pressure has been reduced by a dedicated head profile to reduce the discharge temperature and increase the cooling capacity. Possibilities in terms of uh, different layouts are enormous. So to support designer and engineer, we develop a tool for seasonal calculation that allow dynamical simulations of the system uh, at different ambient conditions by choosing a yearly weather profile for different location around the world, evaluating the seasonal efficiency of the system and not just the punctual uh, efficiency. Another uh, fast growing trend are represented by hydrocarbons and in particular by propane. Uh, usually uh, propane it is used in indirect cycle, chiller with a secondary fluid uh, that cool down the utilities or in a low charge standalone cabinet. Advan uh, advantages of propane are a lot, like CO2, it is a natural refrigerant and can be derived by different industries. Uh, so it is highly available on the market and cheaper than most synthetic refrigerants. Very good performances uh, that are comparable with HFC's system. Uh, also in uh, um, simple uh, um, cycle. Operating and standstill pressure are low, 
also propane uh, as all natural refrigerants, it is considered a long-term refrigerant, having a GWP of three. Challenges that propane introduce are related mainly uh, to its flammability. The safety class is A3, so it is uh, propane is high flammability. And, and uh, most, uh, for most of the system, uh, there is an additional energy consumption to auxiliary uh, energy consumption in an indirect cycle and uh, do rejection of condensation of the cabinet uh, inside a conditioned uh, uh, ambient. Frascold uh, has always believed uh, in uh, hydrocarbons and was the first manufacturer to have a complete range ATEX Zone 2 certified. Uh, hydrocarbons compressors uh, have an optimized uh, part load device specific for uh, hydrocarbons applications. It is guaranteed an optimal balancing to specific technical feature. Uh, respecting to standard series uh, dedicated to HFC, after some laboratories uh, evaluations and the confrontation with lubricant uh, supplier, it has been chosen to adopt a different oil, preferring PAG to POE, having tested better rheology performances in mix with propane. We know that uh, propane has a high solubility in oil, so PAG demonstrate a less decadences of viscosity uh, compared to POE in mix with propane. Other refrigerants that can be suitable solution with low GWP are HFO, like uh, R1234ZA and YF, and HFO blends like R455A, R454C. The advantages that uh, this refrigerant can offer are different. Uh, the system can be very similar to HFC system with most of the components uh, that can be standard components. They have a good performances uh, compared to HFCs. It is possible to use a simple thermodynamic cycle. Uh, considering the actual regulation, also these refrigerants are considered long-term solutions. Uh, having a very low GWP, uh, in all the case, lower than 150. So it's not predicted a prohibition or a freeze out uh, for this refrigerant. Uh, usage of this refrigerant have uh, to take in account flammability. So they are a safety class H12, so lightly flammable uh, with a velocity of pro propagation of flame very low and high initial uh, energy. But at the design level, uh, there is a necessity to make a risk assessment and evaluate if, the, if it is necessary to use ATEX certifies component or not. Uh, Frascold uh, take advantages from the reliability and characteristic uh, of standard series in terms of uh, balancing and oil management, uh, develop the series dedicated to HFO. In this case, the oil is uh, PoE without any indication about the type of installations, Frasco suggests the usage of an ATEX certified series. Also in this case, the certification covers the assembly of the compressor. In the specific risk, if there is a specific risk assessment done by the installer that do not lead to a necessity to have a ATEX certified compressor, also, the standard series is approved with these refrigerants. Uh, we made multiple tests on our test rigs and some tests with uh, some customer uh, are, 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 are now running uh, to assess their reliability on long term. Summing up, uh, F-gas regulation oblige refrigeration industry to renew itself. It grow the necessity to transform refrigerant, refrigerating plants, uh, reducing at minimum the impact uh, on global warming. Uh, the transition to lower GWP refrigerants uh, is started 
and the players of the market need to choose the proper refrigerant uh, that best fits uh, their application. Uh, the most uh, profitable choice, uh, it will be the product of evaluations that can take in account cost, advantages and challenges, maturity of technologies and the competencies. Uh, other, another parameters to take in account, uh, of course, uh, is the efficiency of the system in aim to develop more uh, sustainable systems in terms of overall emissions, uh, considering in this case direct and indirect emissions. Uh, in this scenario became crucial the competency in order to design, conduct and maintain the system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. It was very comprehensive about that gas regulation, how it is now, which is, of course, what uh, we are experiencing now. We have many questions, really, we have a okay. lot of questions, so be prepared. Oh, good. <laughs> Kevin, it's be good. prepared. It's good. We have 130 participants at the moment. So, Sylvia? So, let's start with the Dimitrios. He's asking the 40 kilowatt limit after 2022 is a uh, absorbed power because if it's so i think it's really high and only refers to big supermarkets and industry thank you for the question probably it's not so clear in the in the slide but it's not referred to um, power capacity but is the cooling capacity so the refrigerating mm -hmm. capacity okay okay i guess this answers the question so i go with the second from stefano can you explain something more on the specific oils used in uh, CO2 and HC compressors and why uh, the choice against other type of oil? Okay, thank you for the question. For uh, CO2, I think I haven't, uh, uh, I didn't uh, uh, say nothing about oil, but uh, our uh, standard oil in CO2 application is the POE85. Uh, for application for uh, uh, booster system or mm, just statistical system. Uh, for uh, application with high um, evaporating temperature or uh, heat pump, uh, we suggest uh, PA, PAG 68. Uh, the difference uh, is uh, mainly related to the uh, solubility and the uh, best performance of uh, PAG at high pressure and high temperature. But for standard application uh, like booster uh, in a standard uh, supermarket, so in commercial refrigeration, the uh, POE85 uh, is uh, the best solution. For uh, hydrocarbons, uh, we uh, have as a standard uh, lubricant, the PAG 68. Uh, the choice in this case was uh, um, on uh, PAG 68 uh, because hydrocarbons and uh, in particular propane have a high miscibility um, with, um, with oil. So the mix uh, between oil and uh, um, refrigerant reduce uh, the uh, viscosity of the oil. Uh, so to limit this uh, effect, we choose a oil that have this uh, effect limited. And uh, the PAG in our test and uh, using the competence of uh, our uh, supplier of uh, lubricant uh, demonstrate better performance from this point of view. Okay, thank you for the thorough explanation. Do you have the time for one last question or should we go straight to the debate? No, I think we have more time, yes. Okay, then I go with the one from Lorenzo. He's asking if you as Frascode perform tests on low GWP HFO blends for LVP applications on commercial refrigeration, refrigerated appliances and uh, if yes, how were the results? Oh, thank you for the question. In our lab, clearly we test only the compressor. So we test uh, our, our compressor in various uh, points of the application envelope. So clearly we test uh, low uh, GWP uh, refrigerant. We have tested uh, 
uh, all this uh, log w2 uh, refrigerant in various uh, conditions for sure in for low temperature application i think uh, minus 35 minus, minus 40 of evaporating temperature for sure we tested but uh, in our facility in our laboratories we have uh, more than nine test rigs but uh, we tested only the compressor so not uh, the complete system uh, i think uh, the answer is very good thank you so much thank you silvia i think um, we have time now for the debate we have a lot of questions to be honest so the question that we are not able to answer today we will send to the speaker so we will send it directly the answer if you don't mind now francesco is back with us so we can have a debate in particular we have a very important question which i want to ask to both of you because um, uh, marino is asking um, do you have uh, some indications about the expected shares in the next years to come between hydrocarbon and a2l refrigerants and blends i can add also co2 to be honest you know um what do you think will be the future a2l hydrocarbon co2 in the next years francesco you want to go first yes it's a it's a, it's a good question but it's also a very difficult question because uh, we think that the future and the shares of each of these solutions are quite uncertain and I wouldn't like to launch myself in uh, betting for some numbers. I would say that uh, in any case, uh, there are three these are three possible ways uh, which are uh, in, the, in the frame of the future goals of Europe. We expected that they, are, they, they will get a share, each of them, for sure and uh, they are interested. Of course, our customers uh, don't like to have only one solution. They support the idea that they have a multiple choice of solutions, which may adapt to different uh, size of system or maybe different climates and so on. And therefore, depending on the specific situation, choose what is the best, uh, the best uh, solution for them. Our role as manufacturers, as, as providers of these solutions, is of course to accompany each of, of these customers on each of these technologies with the best expertise and our experience, our long-term experience, and, uh, and uh, of course drive their decisions and accompany them uh, through the exploitation of these technologies. Thank you so much. Uh, what do you think, uh, Kevin? I, I am agree with uh, Francesco. It's very hard to make some uh, uh, speculation about uh, next year, but uh, for sure uh, there, there is a crash, a rising interest, uh, interesting, interest in uh, uh, CO2, in uh, hydrocarbons, uh, and uh, HFO and HFO blends. Uh, I add also the, the HFO blends. Uh, from our observatory, uh, we see a lot of customers that want uh, to have uh, multiple choice. So try to develop uh, different series with different refrigerant to be ready for the future. So I completely agree. Uh, the future uh, will be a mix of uh, these, uh, probably these uh, three family. I want to add probably another uh, big uh, uh, player that can be ammonia, but for uh, um, uh, bigger, bigger, bigger sites probably. But uh, for sure in the future also ammonia uh, will have a central role. Thank you so much. We have some questions here for uh, Francesco. I think the label and the eco design gave a lot of interest. Of course, we are one week away, so must be, of course. <laughs> Two days away, <laughs> actually. <Yeah. laughs> must be a very, interest, very interesting. Um, Mehmet is asking, will energy labels be affixed to products that are produced before March, 11, March 1st, but have been in stock in their warehouses if you have in warehouses uh, stock what do you do with the label it's a, it's a, it's a good, good question thank you very much 
Of course, uh, uh, the regulation says that the obligation is on products that are placed on the market starting from March 1st, so next week. Placed on, on the market means that uh, are sold to a client and uh, the relevant uh, moment in time uh, to decide when the product is placed on the market is when there is the trans transfer of property. So it's normally we consider the invoice date or something like. So if a product has been a long time uh, on the shelf of a warehouse but is sold after 1st March, then uh, the obligation is there and you have to provide that product with the energy level. If it is provided before, so within this week, let's say, before 1st of March, then uh, you don't have the obligation to do that. Okay, very good. One question for Kevin. I think there's a bit of conflict of interest in this because um, Berti Jacob is asking, will vapor compression technology continue to be the technology of choice in the next 10 years? Of course, I'm asking Kevin that if you do if you do compressors, you cannot <laughs> say that the vapor compression is not going to be for sure. For sure. sure. Let's Leaky say your about that. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, honestly, I think that uh, at least, years, uh, so yeah, yeah, in in ten years uh, for sure, uh, vapor compression system will be the leading uh, in this sector, so refrigerating HVAC. Uh, other technology for the moment, uh, and I think in the near future, uh, will not. Uh, now are not ready to be used uh, in uh, large scale and i think uh, it is not uh, so uh, a rest, uh, near future for uh, technologies different than vapor compression system. for example magnetic refrigeration you don't think magnetic refrigeration will be in the future in the, in, in the near in the near near future uh, I, I, I think not uh, I know that uh, there are a lot of, of interest in uh, something different than vapor compression and uh, a lot of study, a lot of effort in uh, research and development. Uh, we take a look also uh, of something different to be on the first uh, uh, line in, uh, in developing new technology. So we know uh, all the developing, the recent developing, but uh, in my opinion, uh, for the very near future, uh, what do you think about uh, about it from a you know from a retailer uh, product uh, point of view? Uh, we believe that uh, uh, solution and technology can become a reality when uh, many gaps are closed. So there is uh, on one side uh, performance and uh, efficiency and reliability on one side. On the other side, uh, uh, second very important gap is uh, to close is the simplicity of the system, because if we want that uh, technology is uh, adopted in many different countries around the world, it needs to be simple. It can't be complicated. And then uh, finally, the last gap to close is the cost. So it has to be affordable, doable for everyone, and it cannot cost 20 times as uh, the most common or most uh, known uh, technology. So all these gaps need to be closed before the technologies really roll out worldwide. And yes. uh, we don't see that happen in the next few years. Good uh, point, good point. For alternatives. One, one question for uh, Francesco. I think we have still, uh, we are four minutes uh, uh late but i think we can have uh, this one because it's very important i believe lorenzo is asking who uh, to francesco could a product be uh, put into the eu market after an incomplete registration in april maybe without uh, the technical documentation according to annex 6 uh, of the eu regulation no, it's, um, it's not possible because all the information must be uh, registered in April about the product and, and then only after that uh, the, the energy level 
is uh, is uh, producible. So since the obligation to produce to deliver products is to bear the energy level, that is possible only if you have succeeded to register all the product information in April. So incomplete declarations will not make the product ready to be marketable and uh, and sellable in the market. One more question for uh, Francesco, uh, because um, this must be done. If you rebuild a cabinet from HFC, here is saying to CO2, I don't think it's possible to rebuild a cabinet from HFC to CO2, but maybe I, I can change the question for you. Uh, is this is from Ian. From HFC to NA12, for example, you need to change the uh, energy label. How can you do it to change the energy label to, from a rebuild cabinet? Well, uh, rebuilding uh, uh, sounds to me like a retrofit. So something that is uh, a transformation or a, a, mo a modification that is done after the product has been already placed in the market. In that case, uh, you have to consider that the energy level is provided at the time of placing in the market and is not mo modifiable afterwards. So when you place a product on the market, you deliver it with uh, the energy level. Then after it is in the market, after some time, you decide to modify the product that way, you will not alter the energy level and the energy level will remain the one originally provided by the OEM. I understand. I understand perfectly. I think it's a very good answer. Thank you for that, Francesco. Okay, I think uh, we have still one question. I think this is for um, Kevin. Time for one question. We have more questions, but I think we have only time for one. This comes from uh, uh, Bertie. Okay. Berti is asking about uh, the timeline of a gas regulation for transport refrigeration. Is there a timeline for transport refrigeration? Because you mentioned stationary, you mentioned refrigeration, but for transport. So uh, I mean, I feel uh, she uh, he means uh, um, Jacob means uh, uh, lorry and uh, truck and lorry. Yeah, refrigerating transport, so truck. Uh, uh, yeah, it's a good question because uh, for uh, the actual F gas, uh, there is uh, no um, limitation for transport refrigeration. There is uh, just uh, some in some uh, limitation in mobile uh, um, air conditioning mm, with, with the uh, our our car. Other uh, part of uh, transport refriger refrigeration are not covered by the actual uh, F gas. So it is one of the points that can be uh, updated in the revision of F gas that the European Commission have in mind. Uh, we hope that because uh, clearly it is a, a important sector in which uh, uh, the uh, direct emission are very uh, are very high, so the impact of uh, uh, global warming of uh, um, refrigerating transport is very high. So for the sustainability of uh, the sector uh, will be a good, a good uh, novel, uh, good news if uh, in the revision of F-gas will be an article that can uh, uh, try to limit it, uh, um, transport refrigerate, refrigeration. Very good. I think it's a good uh, point. It's a good uh, answer. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank well, you. Let's finish with this one. Just give me two more seconds because it's very interesting. Uh, it's from Francesco. Um, end users have already evidenced interest only for uh, EEI, the, uh, the index uh, for energy efficiency, or also for circular economy. Do the end user are in, uh, of interest for secure economy or only for energy efficiency? Well, I believe the interest is definitely for both because uh, the index uh, and therefore the energy class uh, has to do with the energy consumption of the product, which is in the end of the day, it is money. And uh, of course, 
the, the, the cost, uh, the running cost of the equipment is not only the consumption, so the energy bill, which of course also depends on the use you do for the pro of the product, uh, but uh, the, the total cost of ownership depends also on the lifetime cost regarding service and uh, repair and maintenance. So having access or on fast delivery of spare parts on a complete set, easy replaceable, easy maintenance, uh, easy troubleshooting, and so on. In the end of the day, it can impact very much on the lifetime cost, on the running cost of the equipment. And therefore, I believe is not less important than the energy consumption itself. Thank you so much, Francesco, Efta. Thank you so much, Kevin. Frasco, I think we arrived to an end. We still have two questions, but I, I think we can send you by email. And you can answer uh, directly by email. So thanks to all our speakers. We still have 100 speakers connected. We reached uh, a peak of 140 speaker, uh, participants uh, in, the, in the webinar today. So thank you all. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Centro Studi Galileo. Congratulations. Doing all the time a very good job. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Bye. Bye.